You know how the Statue of Liberty looks? Do you know, have you ever been to the Statue of Liberty? Do you see her right now? Where? Exactly. <laughs> see how quick this is? <laughs> like boom, boom. So it is about the future, imagination, and strategic innovation. What is the connection between these three things? And what does strategic, imagination, uh, strategic innovation mean? I like to start with this uh, uh, quote that essentially goes to the core of why we need to look at the future with different eyes. The supposition that the future resembles the past is not founded in arguments of any kind, but it is derived entirely from habit. What you think you will do tomorrow, and I'm glad actually you went, no, I don't know. <laughs> but you know that when you wake up, you will brush your teeth. And you can say that with some certainty, but that is based on habit. It is not exactly something that my, uh, in, a, in a future five years from now, we don't know if we will go to the internet. We don't know if we will have computers. We don't know if we will have blackberries. The supposition that we will have email, it's based entirely on habit. The supposition that certain things will be in a certain way were based on habit 20 years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, and a couple of people got into some trouble by saying things like, I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. Famous quote. There is absolutely no reason anyone will want a computer in their home. This is from the founder of Digital Equipment Corporation. So somebody who had an interest in this market existing. Absolutely no reason. So on what basis is that thing uh, forecast made? On the basis of habit. And lastly, 640K ought to be enough for anybody. In 81, this was not true. <laughs> now, do you know what 640K is? <laughs> what is a photograph? Like a, a medium-sized JPEG is probably, what, 120? So you understand that the computing power that Bill Gates thought people need was equal to a large JPEG. So if you frame it in this uh, term, you understand how dangerous it is to think about the future from habit. Unfortunately, I teach in a business school, man, uh, Rotman School of Management, also teach in a design school. And I looked at uh, what we teach, and I look at what other people teach, and I believe education is the number one place where things happen from habit. And uh, I don't think I'm critical. I think we need to talk about this in education. And we, not, we need to talk about this in many domains of life where things just happen from habit. So. How do we get to see the future f with a new frame of mind? Well, look at three ingredients. Behavior, which is represented here by this circle. What do people <coughs> desire? Possibility, which is what does technology allow people to manifest from what people desire? You didn't know you wanted Facebook until the technology allowed you to use Facebook. You didn't go in the street saying, give me Facebook. I want to show the world my butt. <laughs> or give me YouTube. No. In the moment in which the technology was available, then you allowed yourself to reveal that you wanted the world to know that you exist. And finally, organizational capability. So behavior, possibility, capability. Behavior is, I want to go to the moon in 1961, Kennedy. Capability took nine years, uh, sorry, possibility was fabricated over nine years, and capability was in 1969. This is the story of pure desire. So we want, we can, we will. When these things converge, you have a moment of strategic innovation, which means it is strategic because uh, it, it encompasses many, many things. A strategic innovation that everybody's familiar with will be iTunes. The revolution over the last couple of years is not about the iPod. It's about the i in a pod. It's not about MP3 players. It's about i pod. I am willing to put everything I own as memories into a, onto a device, and I want to carry this device with me, and I want you to know who I am. 
And that device will reveal who I am to everybody, effectively allowing me to get better service, to get customized uh, products, to be somebody, not just anybody. That's what an iPod is. Napster was not about stealing music. Napster was about you giving up your computers to music. So that changes uh, the framework of uh, when you think about the future, if you understand what is the motivation uh, in people. And the motivation in people, in my view, is this. That's my prediction about the future. The future will only be what we want to reveal next about ourselves. Everything over the last five years was nothing more and nothing less than what people wanted to reveal about themselves. These technologies could have not, uh, dev they can develop, but if technology develops and nobody uses it, it, no, what do we do here? The important thing is once you want to reveal stuff about yourself, then technology allows you and empowers you to do it. So who are we? Who is the person that wants to reveal and why do we want to reveal? And I think the core of innovation uh, as an outcome starts with understanding who people and what people are. What do we want? Where do we want to go? So I will walk you through a couple of signals in behavior and I will come back before that at what is the one of the uh, capabilities of a foresight practitioner is to understand and map signals. Signals in behavior, signals in technology, combine multiple signals from different directions and understand what does the future hold once you understand uh, what behavior will be revealed by what technology. So here is the example of uh, the trickster. Long, long time ago, in a land far, far away, three boats land on an island. On this island, people have never seen boats because all they had was small fishing boats. They're the Taino people, and the Taino people looked like this. You can see them, but they were naked. They had no clothes. They had very small rudimentary fishing boats. And they see Christopher Columbus, which is here, and his landing party, two people dressed in armor with swords, implements these people have never seen in their life. They have never seen it, therefore it was no room in their imagination for the possibility of a sword. You have room in your imagination for the Statue of Liberty because you know it exists, you saw it. So now how do I, the trickster, convince these people where Christopher Columbus comes from? They ask Christopher Columbus, where do you come from? Where well, I come from that boat. Actually the question was, how did you get here? I got here on that boat. What boat? They look on the horizon, they can't see anything. The boat is in front of their eyes, but they can't see it, why? Cognition depends on memory. Cognition means I know this thing is a boat. So you can watch things, you can look at things right in front of your eyes, and Goethe said the hardest thing to see is what's right in front of your eyes. It's normal not to understand what you're looking at if you have no frame of reference. So the trickster told the Taino people, close your eyes and I'll describe them to you. I'll make room in your imagination for a boat. Now, how do I make room? Well, I'll take you from what you know to what that thing is. So I will say, imagine your boat. Now imagine your boat holding 20 people. Now imagine your boat, exact boat, now holding 100 people. Well, that's what you're looking at. Oh, that's the boat. So, the, of course, the process probably is mar much more complicated, but what tricksters are, they are mediums into possibility. So, the stories, I will tell you a few more stories this afternoon. Try to see them from the eyes of the trickster, from the eyes of somebody whose role is to enlarge, expand on other people's imagination and mind for new possibility. So, here is a signal that probably you did not pick up. Because if you don't look for signals, you just ignore, s no. This was in the news, but if you don't read it uh, into its implications, it's just a headline on the news. March 21st, Paul McCartney, you know him, right? Signs with Starbucks. Now, Starbucks record label. So Starbucks, what does Starbucks do? Coffee. Coffee. 
Now think, connect. Starbucks has locations where? Everywhere. Is Starbucks one of the most amazing distribution networks you can have if you are Paul McCartney? Sure. But think of something else that has happened before March. What was introduced last January in San Francisco? What was it? A new way of life, the iPhone. The iPhone, not a product, a new way of life, a new way of interacting with mobile space. So you know that probably you have an iPhone, right? When you go to Starbucks, you know what happens. An icon with Starbucks shows up on your iPhone in certain Starbucks. So it connects immediately to the Wi-Fi so wi system. So the fact that he signs a record deal with Starbucks and the fact that Apple connects with a Starbucks is not trivial because it's about music. It's about exactly what he wants from Starbucks to distribute music. Affordances. He signs a deal because he can. What does it mean to me is the first question I ask. Me as an organization, me as an individual, is it good for our organization? These are questions that need to be asked even if you don't work in music, if you don't work, if you work in publishing, if you work in any domain that actually is connected with a distribution of desire, because music is a desire, because it's not food, or maybe it's the ultimate food. So this is where we get into another domain that I'll explore in this lecture. Lily Allen, how many of you uh, listen to her? So, like half listen, half not. <laughs> like, still like uh, which one? The, well, the one that. Uh, <laughs> still, still is the one that. Okay. But uh, the significant thing, you know what's significant about Lily Allen, right? That record, which became the top 10 album of 2006, was never produced by a company, it was produced by her on MySpace. So now, why? Because she can. So now you understand that we live in a time in which things are shifting, benchmarks are changing. The uh, distribution network for music, the production uh, of stuff is now in the power of creators, which are users as well. So now we are dealing with something that <clears throat> we never dealt before, the empowerment of users to become creators, critics, distributors, manufacturers of the product of culture. So signals have meaning and there are questions. So the issue is what questions do you ask? What do you see when you look at a, an iPod? What do you see when you, uh, what do you ask when you look at an iTouch or an iPhone? Well, some people say, all right, calculator, they see this. They ask questions about this. I don't look at this. A strategic practitioner with foresight will look at a black space, will try to understand what will be here next, and try to understand how this is not an MP3 player, how this is not just a nice, fancy design. This is a culture. This is a, a, a product that will redefine not only how we interact with uh, the mobile world, but what we expect from everything else, including the taste of coffee. So we have 800 applications right now. If you go to uh, applications for this phone or, or for the iTouch, web-based applications. So the idea is that any part, and this is also from Goethe, is a manifestation of the whole and not just a component of it. So Christopher Columbus, if you ask the right questions, as a Taino trickster, you would have dealt with these three people <laughs> in a way that would have drastically changed history. So I don't know if you know the story of Columbus. The bottom line was, if you kill Columbus, it's unlikely somebody else will follow him because the, the Spanish empire was uh, bankrupt. They had no more money. This was, Columbus took a long time to convince the queen uh, to get the money for this trip. So if you start asking where does he come from, you analyze it on a horizon by horizon uh, uh, terms. And you say, okay, I can see this at the horizon, three boats with some people on it. But what's beyond the horizon? Well, if I logically ask what's beyond the horizon, I understand these people come from someplace. And where they come from, there are more boats, more people, more symbols, and bigger symbols. 
And then if I ask the right question, I understand, yes, I can see that they come from a place that has many, 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 many places like that. So effectively, this will be an unfolding signal map from Napster to iTunes. This is not about Christopher Columbus. This is about understanding how to ask questions. So in effect, when you see this, you can strategically plan for this. Because this is what is coming. Web 2.0, which I will touch briefly on, is not about the web. It's about the 2.0. It's about the ability of people to author, manage, and distribute their own or remixed content. It's about freedom. It's about manifest freedom. So if you look at an example <clears throat> in technology, Dynatac 1973, this is one of the it's the first uh, Motorola cell phone. What was precise about it? it? Had a radio and a screen. Anybody asking the right questions will understand that if we unfold it, the screen will be color, will have full blown graphics, and the radio will be powerful. And if you reason your way through a technology, and if you add to that technology behavior, you understand this very simple thing. Technology means nothing. Behavior is where monetization takes place. So for any company or organization trying to uh, monetize innovation, usually by that they mean monetize the technology that resulted from an innovation. That is not the way to go. Behavior is where people, uh, where the f t cell phone works. It's you on the phone saying, I'm coming home that is the monetization moment, not the device. So screensavers, wallpaper, messaging, you know what is the most popular thing in Japan right now? Ringtones. Uh, what is the ringtones? Uh, I forgot the name of, uh, uh, Avril Lavigne. Avril Lavigne makes more money in royalties right now in Japan selling uh, ringtones than in the state selling records. You know Avril Lavigne, right? <laughs> now, Japan has a huge population that uses ringtones a great deal. So what could be possible is the question that needs to be asked every time you read a little headline somewhere. What could be possible in the new scope of technology, which is everything media, everything 2.0? Everything media meaning everything a media for people to distribute, manage, create, Everything meaning paper, music, image. Facebook is one thing. Flickr is another thing. YouTube is another thing. Everything is a media for people to reveal who they are next. So how do we know how to answer this question or have an informed number of choices? Because I think in the end, this is what this is all about. Uh, I don't think this is a problem. This is a dilemma. Dilemmas have choices, and choices are multiple. So needs, wants, and desire, and the redefinition of expectations. This is what everything 2.0 means to me. It means that once I'm able to blog, once I'm able to be understood as a, a virtual entity by people I've never met, and actually once I'm able to communicate with people I met once every single day and strengthen a relationship that in the past would have been a passing relationship. Now people have, how many of you are on Facebook? How many friends do you have? 400. 400. 400. The average is 75. And if you have 75, you go, uh. All right. So what do I know about him right now? At 400 friends, he spends an hour and a half on Facebook. <laughs> that means that he doesn't spend that hour and a half watching TV. So if I'm an advertiser, I'll be extremely concerned and really grateful that I know where his eyeballs are. He has only two eyeballs. No, but that's relevant. Ideally, you should watch TV with one and be on Facebook with the other. Or watch TV on your laptop. How many of you watch TV on your laptop? There you go. Is that the future, you think? or it's closer to a manifestation of the future. We don't know. The bottom line and what I was trying to expose was the fact that you are not watching TV while you are doing this. So if I am in the business of advertising, which I'm not, but many companies are, I will be very concerned and really desirous in understanding where do you place your eyes. 
So, is it redefining expectations if you are having a, a, a conversation with 400 people? Absolutely. Because you are now known. Uh, how many of you have Googled yourselves? <laughs> okay. You know, if, if somebody would have told you a year ago, Google yourself, <laughs> you know, it would have been an insult. Like a, some, but it is a, <laughs> why don't you Google yourself? It is a reality, okay? It is a reality that Googling yourself uh, gives you a sort of scorekeeping. Do you think Google is the score? How many of you deep down feel that in the end, that is the ultimate score? The ultimate thing that matters. You think so? Or Wikipedia? Which one do you think? We don't know. Because see, Wikipedia is easier to manipulate than the score on Google. But with 400 friends, the chances are you score a lot. So, <laughs> so yeah. No. No. I want to get rid of it. I don't know how. Okay, somebody made a comment that sounds like an advertisement. I didn't have anything to do with it. No, I can write better than that. So, <laughs> so the agents uh, of everything 2.0 are millennials, which is you, which is everybody born after 1980, everybody for which digital is not a theoretical thing, but it's absolutely practical, but analog is theoretical. <laughs> so. Um, and massive online communities. Massive online communities, when I first created this slide, I was referring to Second Life and uh, World of Warcraft. Now we are looking at Facebook, we are looking at everything else, MySpace, Flickr, and so on. The idea is that a massive online community has this critical word right here, online. It's not offline, it's online. If they are online, they are not someplace else. And in the moment they are online, they are part of a world that is a completely different world than the world in which products, services, advertising, and other things of the habitual kind are sold, exchanged, or desired to be exchanged. So this is the 2.0 everything. It's not happening online, but what happens online will transfer in values out in the world offline. So we call that a duality in data space. Duality is you have a dual life. You exist as a digital signature. All of you exist right now. We have cell phones right now, right? On. All that signature. We are a digital presence of exactly as many cell phones as we have. Some place out there, there is a machine that knows. <laughs> now, that's not the matrix. That's not a frightening thing. That's just a reality. And you know them to know because that's why your phone is on, because that's the whole purpose, right? You want to be in touch. You want to connect. So the themes are participation, empowerment, and communication 2.0. And this means redefining communication uh, in a time in which now objects can communicate to one another. I was uh, meeting a few of you earlier, and my phone went beep, beep. Now, my phone wanted to tell me you got a message. So how does my phone know you got a message? Some other machine communicates with my machine, and it says, tell this guy he got a message. So now we are looking at communication in a different way, because human beings would have not interrupted the meeting I had with students, because there is a, you know, social norms and habits and ways in which we conduct ourselves. The machines and devices we deal with don't yet know what being polite is all about. They don't understand that. And, and I think the next level of technology will ha have context awareness and will understand that when your phone and your phone and your phone and the presence of my phone, since none of our numbers match, we are not friends. Therefore, turn off. We have business to do. So if you combine your lists on your phones with your 400 Facebook friends, then you start understanding how complex 2.0 is in terms of communication, how valuable also. So this is the context that we are discussing here. Xbox. How many of you have Xbox? How many of you know that's not a Windows machine? It's a completely new thing. 
which is stunning. Okay, it's stunning. It's stunning in showing the willingness of a company like Microsoft to go with an unproven, completely new technology into a completely new domain, which is video games. But we see we call them games, like it's a trivial thing, game, like it's not a serious thing. But you know what the biggest product introduction of all time was? Halo. You know what Halo is about? Halo is about Master Chief. <laughs> all right? <laughs> Halo, Halo is about Master Chief. How many of you use Axe deodorant? Or uh, how do you use it? Do you think Master Chief will use that? No? Check the bottle. Check the design of the, or use the body wash. Use the Kilo body wash by Axe. That's Master Chief. <laughs> Completely. So you see where they connect, right? So then, here is a little map. This is a core of, and I wish we had a, a slightly darker room, but I hope you can see it. Can you see it in the back? The type, can you see the type in the back? Okay. What this does, this creates expectations. How many of you made money on the Xbox by playing against other people online? Nobody yet. How many of you think Microsoft will make money at one point, like real money, the Microsoft economy? I made $780 three years ago on eBay selling my profile in Tiger Woods Golf, PJ Golf, where I had $28 million. I could beat Tiger Woods, Sunday Tiger Woods on any given day. I had the best attributes. I played four weeks, okay, nonstop. And I had 150% on everything. Did you play PGA golf, anybody? You know what it takes, okay? It takes attributes. <laughs> you need to maximize everything. So the thing is, initially it sounds really silly, but do you know what a cyber athlete is? <laughs> You're looking at it. <laughs> I, I mean, you think, you think I had coordination? Now, there is a cyber athlete. Uh, I, I, win, I want you to Google this term in the next couple of days, cyber athletes. And you'll see how much money they make. It's a huge, huge thing. So, so these are not trivial things. This is life, Google, YouTube, MySpace. How old is YouTube? When did you ever, when do you remember hearing first of YouTube? 2006. It sold immediately after for 1.6 billion. Did not ever make money at that point, had no asset value. Like, what was the value? An old logo? Like an old-looking logo. And a technology that what? Like, who can I, and now, obviously today it's a different game. How many of you go on YouTube every day? Oh, because you go on Facebook. That's why you don't, you don't have time. <laughs> All right, but what it happens is that then you start in awareness of certain things, start to create expectations of other things and desires which are yet unnamed. And then as we grow, these desires start to have names. But they create other desires are yet unnamed, which usually manifest themselves uh, as, wow, I never knew I needed this. You know, the web, I didn't grow up with the web. I didn't go to school with the internet. I didn't know I needed the internet until I saw the internet. So peer-to-peer -peer television moved quickly into 300 uh, companies offering TV on your desktop and extremely good quality. So now everything is moving. Now we're talking about sustainability in this context. So we have to be aware what do we really mean by uh, climate change and uh, ways of addressing when you have this culture to deal with. And then this grows into this entire thing, which is crowd cloud, crowd uh, mining, and uh, you know, crowdsourcing. And crowdsourcing was a theory a year ago, but now the crowd is on Facebook. And you can source the, the, uh, the movies they look and they search for. And you can understand where the culture is of the moment if you just take a look at YouTube, which is what I'm saying you should do. Half an hour of that Facebook time dedicated to. Now, why? Because you need to connect the dots. Somebody needs to connect the dot. So how do we innovate? This is Gutenberg. Services, experiences, products, content, 
and business models in this and for this new context. When we had the printing press, it changed everything, but for a very small group of people. Essentially, the church was the main beneficiary of the press because the Bible was printed. Very few people knew how to read, but slowly people started to read and produce culture for this thing. So this is not just a tool. This is a way of life. So is creativity what we need? My suggestion is that it's not enough. And most people will think it is enough because they never really understand the definition of creativity, which is this, the ability to use the imagination to develop new and original ideas or things. The critical word is imagination. And one of the things I have done over the past couple of years, I wrote a book called The Imagination Challenge, in which I argue that we, in education and uh, after, immediately after kindergarten, effectively have designed a system that kills imagination on purpose. And that has to change, because if it doesn't change, then we will not be able to address things from any other point of view except habit. So the required capability is to imagine possibility. So now we have this map, and how do we understand what the future holds and what's beyond the horizon? We need to imagine what is the possibility now afforded by these little things, or these many little things. So possibility means understanding what is the core of why people do things. Take the same technology, digital technology, discover the deep human archetypes, support system, and uh, the need that people actually are after when they do something. And a piece of equipment like this, a device, can become this, the reason you take photographs, which is to retain the memory. The first level of memory is smell. How many of you think Kodak has patents that connect smell with photographs? Well, is it normal for a company of that size to have such a patent? Absolutely. It is, and they do. Because it is, it is normal for them, it is normal for them to understand what is the root human desire that connects us to a camera. Is it the camera? Is it the memory of the image? Or is it the memory of the moment? What do you want to pass along to your friends? You want to pass along, I wish you were here, not how the mountains look in Switzerland. So it's a much more human thing than just a visual. So imaginative questions is what we need. And I'm using, as you see, one of my favorite movies, The Matrix. Can you see The Matrix up in the back of the room? Okay. So you will be my reference point for anything that people <laughs> will not be able or be able to see. New narratives, which is new stories about the future, and scenarios. S questions will lead to narratives, scenarios need to be imaginative, and then you get an imaginative new future. The challenge when you write a story about the future is what? The future is as exciting as your Oh, you're such a good student. <laughs> exactly. You know, people tell you all the time, the only limit is the limit of your imagination. Well, wait until you see the next five slides, then you'll think that, then you'll see that that line is really damning because the limit of your imagination is right here. Not yours, obviously. Everybody in this room is excluded from my generic comments. But, um, Imagination is a mental faculty forming images or concepts of external objects not present to the senses. So, imagination doesn't deal with a boat that is in front of your eyes. Imagination deals with the thousand boats you cannot see, but which are obvious because you see one. So, imagination deals with what happens now that you have Napster. How many of you admit using Napster many years ago? Great. All right. How many of you know what digital rights management is all about? Obviously, you use Napster. Therefore, even if you knew digital rights management, you went against uh, DRM. You went against that, which I applaud you for, because I think that is something that will critically change the landscape of intellectual property in the next couple of years. So it is a mental faculty, which means it can be addressed by somebody 
in a storytelling way. And I will suggest to you that the attribute that differentiates us from other animals, the chief attribute, uh, is our ability to tell stories. Not only our ability, but our obsession with perfecting ways to tell stories. And I will show you a few slides in which uh, I use George Lucas as an example of one of the greatest storytellers of a story that is not that great, but it's told in a masterful way. And in the course of telling that story, actually the story is not great to me, but great to many people. Master Chief is not great as a character to me, but great. Now, my hero is Toy Story. My hero is, hmm? Not Woody. Who do you think Buzz Lightyear? From here, I mean, the immortal character is him, in my view. And you know, the, I can go and buy him. And, I, and he will look exactly the same. And uh, I'll explain why that is important, because that was a historic moment. The moment in which a digital character became a toy the same day the movie was released, because the file was digital. That type of thing changes expectations. And I just saw the movie Beowulf, Beowulf that's how you pronounce it? Beowulf. Beowulf, today, digital movie, blew my mind. How many of you know this movie and know it's a digital movie? Every character in that movie is like Gollum. Yes! <laughs> so now, imagine you, I mean, not like Gollum in terms of acting ability, but uh, in the way, so I'm not sure why we need Angelina Jolie at one point. <laughs> Once we have her digital file, I'm not sure we will. Uh, it's a signal that is relevant, and uh, I intend to watch that movie again very soon. If you didn't see it, it's worth watching just to understand this is a historic uh, thing. So organizations need imagination for business models to ensure their continued integration to the social, economic, and cultural stream. I rushed this thing because what is important is this, cultural stream, the fact that it is a stream, the fact that it is moving. And the challenge of imagination is this, we have engaged ourselves into an organized death of imagination after childhood, essentially building a system that looks very much like this. I don't see the difference between a school and a prison, and I teach in two schools. I should be, I have never been to a prison, but I've, I've had photographs. It's the idea of the grid. It started with work and play being defined as a dichotomy, which is when you work, you don't play. When you play, you don't work. It's manufactured, this dichotomy. And it was manufactured with the industrial system, with the industrial revolution. It was manufactured to give a distinction between consumption time, leisure time, and work. So. If you look at the fact that most work deprives us from the opportunities for imagination, you'll see where the challenge is today for many companies in coming up with imaginative solutions. They simply do not have the ecology of imagination in uh, the structure of the organization, physically or mentally. So work demands that we subcontract play to athletes, which is an explanation why Tiger Woods makes $1.5 million when he, you know, a weekend. And Tiger Woods makes more money, less effort he makes, which is interesting. If you play golf, you understand what I mean. So lower the score, more money you make, which is less effort. So that's interesting because that implies mastery. And in the moment you understand why we subcontracted to athletes something we cannot do ourselves, you understand that the social value we place on professional sport is an important thing for us. It's an important venue. Without play, imagination dies. And without imagination, creativity dies, now that you know that creativity is dependent on imagination. So this was a very short series of uh, slides to explain why I believe we are in a uh, crisis of imagination. The creation of something new is not accomplished by the intellect, but by the play instinct acting from inner necessity. This is Carl Jung, and it's an important thing to understand that innovation and the greatest human innovation happened in this thing, playing at leisure. Playing at leisure, which means playing with no hope for gain, with no hope for an end result, just trying to discover, just exploring. And um, 
I will not bore you with this map, but all I want to say is this. We have a crisis today between the generation that plays at leisure. This is Tiger Woods. Playful work is what Tiger Woods does is right there. It's in between playing at leisure and playful work. And we have a, an analog generation which is essentially moving towards the best they can hope is playful work, work that is around here, in which what they want to do they get paid for. Acting and directing is at the top, so you understand the type of acting and directing are playful work. Playing at leisure is when you play golf, you fish, and so on. But the idea is that the gap right now between the analog and the digital generations or cultures is exactly this one. The expectations of your group should be to play at leisure and make money at it, and the expectations of this group is to migrate here. They do not speak the same language. Now, why is that important? Because of this guy. This guy is Michael Faraday. What he, you know Michael Faraday, right? What was his profession? Huh? Bookbinder, yeah. So he was not, therefore, whatever he did in the domain of electricity was play, because he was not making money in our definition today. So from Michael Faraday to Google Earth and the nature of innovation as play, the idea is that everything we have discovered, we discovered in play. In, in play, not as trivial pursuit, but as mental play. Play as attitude, play as mind space. So he was asked by the Prime Minister of England, what use is electricity for? Which is probably the biggest question of all time. How can you answer a question like this? What use is electricity for? How can you answer this question in 1845, 1860? What would you say? You don't even know. Oh, yeah. the answer was, oh, it will create civilization. No, I don't believe you. So how do you specifically answer? So here's the greatest answer of all time. There is every possibility that you will soon be able to tax it. <laughs> Because if you think about the frame of reference, and that's the greatest trickster answer of all time. He is a trickster in this moment. He makes room for what the prime minister can actually understand. It is a great thing to tax it. Actually, it's a handsome. Now, what did he get in return? His image on the 20 pound bill. So it is in play that we made our greatest discoveries. And imagination as a working method means this, means to unlearn and it's interesting to talk about unlearning in a school, but unlearning is actually a way of learning. We need to unlearn what we think and what we are told people want. Otherwise, the World Wide Web would have never happened. On the basis of, is there a market for this, which is a typical benchmarking question, a lot of things that we use today would have never happened. So we need to unlearn uh, everything or most things, and the fear of unlearning is the fear is connected to this imagination. What stops us from having our imaginative mindset is that we don't want to get rid of habit. Now, what needs to be unlearned is most of it. Most of the things that we have learned, and in my case, everything I learned in my university, I needed to unlearn. I could not sit here and teach you what I learned in school. Uh, consumer, creator, amateur, professional, format, platform, distribution, etc. value. Greatest unlearning moment, Mademoiselle, Mademoiselle d'Avignon, Picasso. The ugliest painting of all time was considered when it was introduced. People were shocked. It was in hiding for 39 years, not shown. It's today the most expensive painting. And the most uh, considered crucial in the development of art. So the new capability is understanding how the iPhone is not just another phone. But what is it? Well, it is not a product because innovation is not about product. It is a culture. Innovation is about a culture the way the sewing machine is about a culture. It creates the same empowerment, the sewing machine. At the time, it created the empowerment of mothers being able to create clothes or to create, to manufacture clothes for their children. And that is empowerment. It's a way of life which is usually a better way of life. So I'm very optimistic about what technology does because I'm very optimistic about people in general. So 
Is that a signal when you got up? Okay. <laughs> so the ecology of, of innovation is the ecology in which you allow yourself to put glasses, sunglasses, and a hat on a variety of dogs. It is free. <laughs> it is separate from real life. It is uncertain in outcomes. It is unproductive. In other words, don't. I'm using here an image of something you might know, a dream catcher. How many of you have seen a dream catcher before? Do you use it? Does it work? It's yeah. older, huh? Made it from yeah. It will survive all of you. It will survive all the companies on the planet today. A product, product that combines neatly work and play. Because does it have a function? We don't know. Whenever it works, we are asleep. <laughs> so that's the ideal product. Uh, whoa. <laughs> that is, uh, it's governed by its own rules. In other words, it says, I catch bad dreams, I release good dreams. You go to bed, I'll take care of stuff. And you say, okay. So we said, okay, for thousands of years to the dream catcher, okay? So it's never a task. It's an ecology in which you are the trickster. And this is why I wanted to start this whole story with uh, the image of that trickster. The job description is imagine, create, execute. You have to imagine it first. So the challenges that we have today are not how to fit innovation to business, which is the problem of innovation methodologies and innovation management is that they mitigate an innovation until nothing is innovative about it. Why? Because innovations threaten the status quo. They threaten the company. The challenge is how to fit business to innovation. And this is where Google is a great company. Google is a classy example of a company that creates businesses out of innovation. And Apple uh, does the same thing. I recently gave a lecture at Unilever, and here is their challenge. How to fit Unilever to 2.0? How to fit any company to 2.0? You know who understood uh, the signals a few years ago? IBM. IBM is effectively a new company today because they reshaped the organization for 2.0 and beyond. So what you need to do that to create an atmosphere in which you can create business out of uh, imagination and innovation, so fit the organization, uh, create organizations around innovation, you need to create an innovative culture, a culture that recognizes innovation but also understands that it is a noun. It is not a verb. It's not a process. It is an outcome. And that is critical in understanding that innovation is, ah, an innovation. How did I get here? I was innovative. How was I innovative? Oh, I had imagination and I had freedom. So freedom, imagination, and innovativeness create innovation. You need a new mindset <clears throat> to create that culture. And you need a new spirit. So there are two. I'll walk you very quickly because I'm uh, taking a bit too much of your time, and I have way more slides than I thought I would have time to go through. So uh, I need a decision at one point if I continue for the audience or? As long as you want. OK. Are you OK if I continue? Until the natural end. OK. Uh, OK. Innovative, uh, so you have a spirit and a mindset. And how do we start innovating? Well, understanding this connection between desire and the outcome. Desire is at the root of want, and want is at the root of need. And that's why the, my first slides were about need, want, and desire. Desire provides the why. I want to put a man on the moon is not the reason that uh, is uh, sufficient to start the race to the moon. The desire to beat the Russian is the thing that Kennedy wanted. You are familiar with the statement, right? I want to have a man on the moon by the end of the decade, which happened in 1969. So desire, innovation. The innovative spirit, these are forces which come from different directions and they provide different things. One provides the meaning of stuff, the other one provides the means. These are the tools and these are the ideas. So you cannot create tools before knowing what they are for. 
And that is critical because a lot of people are afraid that you know, uh, you know, technology is taking over. No, technology is not taking over. Behavior is using technology. Technology that is not used by behavior, it's a dead phone in a drawer. So a phone that is not in use is not a telephone, it's just a piece of plastic. It becomes a telephone when we say, honey, can you hear me? You know that moment. So to innovate is a verb, and it works like this. So now we have a map. We understand what are the forces at the different poles. Now, does it work from the center or from desire? Well, the initial plan works from desire, because you need to understand, why do I want to do this? Because this is the ethos. The ethos is here. We want to beat the Russians. And actually, the, the exact quote is, can we beat the Russians? The memo, it's a memo from April 11, 1961. So what I illustrate here is that these two things, mindset and ideas, I'm going to go back. Mindset and uh, I, uh, ideas have to happen at the same time. And you need to have a tension between them at all times. You cannot throw tools without ideas or ideas without tools. Why? Because imagine, create, execute was the mandate of the trickster. So imagine, execute, imagine, execute. If you imagine and don't execute, then it's useless. The thing doesn't exist. So a culture of innovation needs a few more things. And then we get into, once we have the other things that I illustrated, now you can have a strategic focus. Now you can add tools. And then you add incentives. A lot of companies add incentives before understanding why are we innovating. And they throw money on the table. They say, if you get 25 intellectual property disclosures, I'll give you $30,000 a year as a bonus and, and call you a master innovator. OK, so people start innovating things. <coughs> All sorts of things that do not improve the bottom line of any company, but they have disclosures. And that was the deal. So that's not the thing. This is, not, this is the most important thing. Then the tools, which include benchmarks. Met, how do you measure the value of what you're innovating? Uh, rules, it's a bit more complicated. You need values and so on. But this gives you an idea that once you have everything, then it starts to work from here, recognizing desires. So it works like that. Because what you want, I just go to one thing. What you want to end up with is an innovation that has a root in desire. That is a phone with a camera. Did any of you think you'll have a camera on your phone 10 years ago? Did you? Did you think that 11-year-old kids today will have phones in their pockets? When you were 11 years of age, <laughs> did you have your personal phone? No. Do you have phones now? Now, isn't that unbelievable? Now, do you realize that we have more to tell? Do you think, is that because we want to talk more to one another, or because we have more to say, or because we are smarter, or is the connection between behavior and affordance made by technology clear? Of course it is. So it's not an invention. And why would we accept a camera that is substandard on our phone when we know that photography can be 100 pixels or whatever? What's a meg 1.2 megapixels on a camera or 2 megapixels, right? 10 on a camera? On a, no, on a cell phone. What's the maximum anybody has? Two, I think. 2 megapixels, you can buy a camera now with 10 megapixels for 500 or less. But you know why we accepted that really, really shabby, fuzzy photograph? Because for 35 years, we went to silent movies. OK, imagine that for 35 years. So imagine me going to a boardroom and saying, I have a great idea. <laughs> I have a great business idea. I'm going to make pictures of pe moving pictures of people, and I'm going to create stories that nobody will understand because it'll be like that. Or I'm going to create a, this is 35 years, OK? Now, and what's interesting about this, it's a new technology, unproven, coming from a place where a spectacle was music, drama, acting, theater. So people had voice in this stuff. It wasn't like we went to theater, which was pantomime. No. It was a complete gamble, and it worked. 
So now I think, you know, the danger was when they introduced the talking movies. That's the funniest bit. They were afraid that people would not go to talking movies. They were not afraid that people won't go to silent movies. So, our job in innovation, uh, in strategic innovation, is effectively this. From people's desires to innovation outcomes. But how do we get to the core of what desire is? When do we start facing who the human beings are, truly? What is the new core competence? Well, this one, from people's desires to innovation outcomes. And what does that include? Focus, strategic focus, tactical language. How do we speak to the people that now use Facebook? Obviously, there is a gap between people that sign their letters TXX or XX or LOL. So whoever does not understand what LOL means in a text message will have a very hard time communicating with somebody that uses that every day. But not communicating in text, communicating, period. So communication 2.0 includes laugh out loud in short form. So the thing is, the disconnect between these two cultures or that gap I was illustrating, it's bigger and bigger every day because your culture or the millennial culture listens to the Beatles, but the analog culture does not listen to 50 Cent. And that's very important because it is not just not listening to 50 Cent, it's not understanding the mindset of Kanye West and all, 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 all these people. And that is fundamental at the root of culture because ideas, value, imagination, uh, Picasso is about that, it's about Kanye West. How many of you watched the Grammys? How many of you watched Kanye sing that song about his mother and felt that was a phenomenal moment in music because it was a completely new type? Did you like it? Did you feel it was a different tempo? Completely new, new uh, hip hop. He will redefine, that moment redefines music for a completely new generation. It's not trends anymore. Like this is not a trend, this is life. This is culture and this guy has the power, has the power of technology plus the power of financing to shape culture and he has the audience.